We are delighted to welcome President Mohammad Nasheed, who actually now goes by the title President, President Mohammad Nasheed. Being a former president, he carries the first title, and now being the head of the parliament, the speaker of the Moldavian parliament, he has the second title, which in the local dialect equ equates to president. So welcome President, President Mohammad Nasheed to the Kigali Global Dialogue and to the live studios. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And thank you for ORF for organizing this. It's an excellent event um, that we are able to have a, a number of conversations on very important matters and subjects. Thank you very much for the invitation. No, thank you for joining us, sir. I am going to, uh, since this is a fast-paced format, I'm going to go straight to the meat of the conversation. I'm going to ask you the first question. Uh, how do you view the recent politics of Maldives? Have we reached a point of stability, or are you still fearful? that things could turn ugly again? Well, not many nations get a ch second chance on democracy. In 2008, we were able to amend our constitution and have our first multi-party elections. But then in uh, 2012, we lost it uh, to a coup. And then we had this seven years, five, seven years uh, of uh, re authoritarian rule. But again, we had our elections. Uh, in 2013, we had elections, but those elections were stolen. And, but we conceded that, and we stayed back. We did not want to raise any discontent any further. Uh, we feared that if we did that, the country would be moving towards civil conflict. conflict. Uh, so we stayed back, and we wanted another election, and we wait we waited for the uh, next election, and in 2018, although I was not able to contest because the government wouldn't allow me to contest, uh, our uh, parliamentary leader, Ibrahim Omar Saleh, contested, and we won. And since then... And you won with a massive landslide. Ma ma massive. And then after that, uh, we also had parliamentary elections uh, last May, mm -hmm. and we won the parliamentary elections with a landslide again, very handsomely. So in terms of uh, the mandate of the people, there is no doubt. But um, your question is, um, are we going to fall again? Uh, can we stabilize matters? Um, I'm very confident that we are, we will be able to stabilize. And I also think that um, our, our development partners, partners, especially India, do understand what's going on in the Maldives. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, they would also keep an eye on the situation. Uh, um, most importantly, India has um, um, assisted, contributed for our development a lot. Recently, uh, when our president visited India, uh, your government has pledged $1.4 billion of assistance. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to go a long way. And we, we believe that we will be able to deliver our pledges. So we think that the future is bright. There's a second significant partner that you have engaged with recently, China. Uh, and I, I invoke them because they too have invested uh, in projects and um, certainly infrastructure projects in, in the Maldives. They uh, are significant uh, economic actors anywhere in the world and they have a huge treasury to disburse loans and debts and um, of yeah. course even assistance and aid. Uh, how Very is little in assistance and aid. Uh, that is the Maldives. Yes, experience. yes. No, so how do you view the texture of your relationships with these two emerging economic actors with the ability to shape development agendas? Now, everyone must understand that we are an Indian Ocean country. India is just a few miles away from our northernmost island. And, you know, we read the same books, we watch the same films, we eat the same food, uh, we listen to the same music, um, we are the same people. And people-to-people -people contact and dialogue with India and the Maldives runs far, far, far back than any other country. Mm -hmm. And also because of geography, we are right next to you. So everyone must understand that our, our relationship with someone else cannot be at the expense of our relationship with India. So uh, we are uh, trying to tell everyone, yes, we want to have friends, we want to have good relations, but please don't try and suggest that that relation sh should be at the expense of someone else. So once um, China understands that, and I believe that they will understand, 
uh, the, I think we would probably be able to have, a, have far more stability in the Indian Ocean. The Maldives doesn't want to be sandwiched in between uh, hostilities between any, any two countries. Mm -hmm. And all countries must understand where we also stand. Now, in terms of uh, contribution from China, much of it was commercial loans. Okay. And all of it was done through commercial Chinese commercial companies or Chinese state-owned mm -hmm. enterprises. And most of the projects were priced very high. They came in, they did the work, and they sent us a bill. So it's not the loan interest rate as such, but more the costing, the costing itself. So, I mean, I'll give you an example. So they over-invoiced you they, and then charged you for they, it. Yeah, yeah. But, and so, thereafter, you have to now also repay the interest yes, rate and the principal amount. And the principal amount. Now, for instance, the bridge. Uh, GMR gave us a quotation for the bridge for $77 million. Mm -hmm. And when we did it through a Chinese company, it's $300 million. So there's no way we can actually pay on uh, pay back any of these. The economic viability does not exist. Does, does not exist. So when we can't pay back, uh, what we are seeing in other countries is that they are asking for equity. Correct. And with equity, we relinquish land and sovereignty. So I don't think that's... Uh, so uh, you possibly would have over the last seven years, uh, since 2013 or six mm -hmm. years, uh, had Chinese invested a number of such projects. Yes. Now, a country of your economic size, mm -hmm. although your per capita income is multiple times that of India, but your economic it, it, it size is, small. is smaller. How can a country of yours manage this um, Chinese debt diplomacy, as it were? Uh, do you, will you need help from others to get out of this? Would you need others to step in and replace certain companies? What is the longer term plan to uh, nullify these, uh, the, the, the albatross around mm -hmm. your neck? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first we have to save. We have to save enough money so that we can pay it back. Okay. Now, we, I think we owe, uh, we owe about $3.4 billion. To the Chinese? To the Chinese. Companies. Uh, companies various companies. Various companies. Um, and come next year, 2020, we would have to spend 15% of our budget oh on paying it back. While we pay 15% pay for education, another 15% for health. Mm. So paying back is 15%. Yes, um, what we, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I can't see how um, our development can be that rapid so that we have that amount of savings, uh, that amount of growth to have that amount of savings. So we must renegotiate. Uh, China must understand that in our view, this is not commercial. We have, don't you, have you reached out to the new, has the new government reached out to the Chinese to... Yes, the new, the new government has, uh, the foreign minister has visited uh, uh, China. Uh, this is not commercial. Uh, what happened between the Chinese Exim Bank and, and the Chinese state-owned... Uh, uh, yeah, but the Chinese state-owned enterprises uh, is not commercial and therefore we must not go into necessarily commercial arbitration. Correct. Uh, but we done at the G two G level. You could reach a yeah. mutual Mu agreement. There, there has to be some some form of mutual mutual understanding, mutual mm -hmm. agreement. Um, I believe China would see the sense, would see that we can't handle this, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore find an uh, arrangement. Let, let me ask. Let me come turn back to India uh, before I come back to your favorite subject. Uh, as a political leader who has uh, non-violently fought for democracy uh, for much of your political life, you know, from your early days, actually. Uh, and uh, as an institution and as an individual, I know you for mm. now close to 14 years. Yes. Uh, so uh, how has your appreciation or appraisal of India's engagement with Maldives been through these 14 years? And do you think that there is a sense that India should have done more or could have done more at certain points? Or do you, in hindsight, believe that India perhaps got the balance right? Uh, uh, in hindsight, I believe they got it right. And, and you know, this, is, this is a big say, yeah. because I have been very critical the last seven it's years. True. Uh, and at times, very, very frustrated. And at times, uh, uh, but uh, in hindsight, the manner in which they dealt with the situation in the Maldives is excellent. I can't say much, but you know, of what I've known, what I've seen, and I have seen everything, and I knew what they were doing, and I think they've done an excellent job. Indian diplomats are clever, 
and they've delivered. It's strange that I have to say this, but no, they no, have done that. No, believe they, me, they have done that. You know, Jai Shankar is now your uh, uh, minister. Again, the top diplomat. Yeah, the top the diplomat. At one point, he was the first secretary in the Maldives. Correct. So, career, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, he understands us, mm. and, and he's done it excellently. Hats off. So uh, let me uh, switch back to perhaps even a, a more important issue, as it were. Uh, climate change, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to get into the politics of that term, but the reality is that sea waters are rising. Mm. Uh, some parts are getting colder, mm -hmm. some parts are getting warmer. Uh, the monsoon patterns are likely to get erratic. Cyclones and hurricanes mm -hmm. uh, are affecting more people than ever before. The intensity is increasing. Um, if you were to ask uh, certain scientists, they would claim that even the jet stream and other uh, 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 high atmosphere uh, uh, currents are, are transforming. Uh, some would argue that this can be uh, probabilistic as an assessment and not uh, deterministic. But let's at least begin with the real reality that biodiversity has shrunk, plants are dying, mm. forests are shrinking, uh, uh, oceans are suffering, and the earth is scorched. Mm. You have been a vocal proponent of uh, ambitious, aggressive and determined climate agenda by all world leaders. I met you the first time was on a climate conversation and I can, without hesitation saying, without any hesitation I can say that you were pushing India to do more. If you remember yeah, in 2008, remember, 2009. Very well. And India is doing more now. India has started doing I, that. India, India has started doing that. So you have always been ahead of your times when it comes to the debate on climate policy as a world leader. You, I think, hosted your first cabinet meeting underwater. Uh, to, in a sense, uh, bring to shock people into imagining a world where sea waters are uncontrollable. Impress upon the international community the gravity. To, to, the urgency. Uh, urgency of the issue. It's that, and that meeting, if I recall, was perhaps 10 years ago. Yes. Now, it's 2019. Yes. I suspect mm -hmm. it was just before Copenhagen. Yes. It yes. was 10 years ago. Has global governance and has political leadership across the world failed us in creating a framework a sustainable and viable framework to respond to perhaps the most significant challenge to communities, countries, people. Mm. Has the UN failed? Uh, Has the UN failed? Have the big powers failed? Where, are, where is the silver lining? Where do we seek solutions? Now, first, if we take climate change as an ethical issue or a human rights issue, it's very difficult to go forward. But once we start seeing it as an economic issue, and once we start seeing the economic viability of a new economics, uh, then things look very, very different. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the economics, economic viability of renewable energy uh, and a low carbon development strategy was not because of UNFCCC. It was because of the markets and it, the it innovators, was, and, it, the innovators and the private sector and you know uh, 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 the power purchasing agreements in Germany uh, and the production of solar panels in China uh, meant that these things were so cheap were available to all of us. To all of us. And it, it meant that these things were so cheap yeah. that therefore we could come up with new technology. So people say that uh, uh, Chinese coal and German consumers underwrote the development of solar powers for the world. Yes. And so now, in any given situation, solar is cheaper than coal. Yeah. So even if you try to uh, sell a coal plant in California, you're not going to do that. You're not so there is a market uh, signaling that uh, uh, the business case for solar is strong. It's strong. And India became the largest uh, uh, installation, uh, the largest country of uh, new installations last year and the previous year because the market viability of installations exists. Yes, but the, the problem is that India has invested a lot on coal. That's talk. Yes, the, yeah. and we have also invested in diesel. Many countries are in this problem. So then the electricity departments are unwilling to purchase. The incumbency, the yeah, yeah, yeah. They are un they're not willing to purchase, uh, give out power purchasing agreements. They're not willing to purchase renewable well, energy. They are in a lock and pay. Yeah. Because they have to pay back. Correct. They are, they are. Correct. So we need an arrangement of uh, somehow buying off these obsolete plants. 
Correct. Uh, so and retiring them. Uh, uh, and, and so retiring. literally like you, reti- like you give the golden handshake to certain yes. employees, yes. you have to give the golden handshake to certain institutions. Yes, exactly. So uh, I think if uh, the World Bank and the uh, international financial system can find a mechanism to buy out uh, existing coal plants, existing diesel, and the coal stock, and, and, the coal stock, and then decommission them, hmm. then w- w- of course it's going to be simple. So, uh, and, and we are not talking about... So, uh, so uh, let's go back to the international financial system. Unfortunately for countries such as India yeah. and Maldives and yeah. uh, many others, um, while we may be loud voices, and in, some, in the case of India, large market, mm. uh, we are still not the determinants or the big boys on the financial high table. Yeah. Yeah. It is still New York, London, yeah. Paris, yeah. Uh, 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 Basel and a few others where these big decisions are made. Are the political leaders of the world unable to compel banking and financial institutions to uh, to support uh, their political vision? I think they just haven't even done the sums of how to do it. They, I, I really don't think the World Bank and the IMF has done the sums. They have not thought of buying off and decommissioning a coal plant. Because they are geared to create new, not to retire the old. Yes. That's how the bureaucracy yes. gets its so, promotions and its yes. rewards. So, I mean, uh, uh, instead of spending their money on, let's say, new plants, even if it is renewable, my view is that if, you, if they do the sums, it would be far better for them to buy existing plants and decommission them. So, I think... Uh, and allow the market to come up with a viable economic solution. A viable solution. economic solution. Mm-hmm. So, uh, basically... But, but, uh, but let me interrupt here. Maybe in certain countries this could work, but in many parts in Africa, for instance, as you heard one of the uh, interventions this morning, mm-hmm. uh, energy access is still a mirage, and the state is incumb- it is incumbent on the state to provide that public utility. Right now, these countries have very weak macroeconomic uh, conditions. Mm-hmm. If you were to take a hundred million dollar investment from a certain country, your monetary policy will go for a toss yeah. because the GDP size is so yeah. small. Yeah, yeah. Right. So for these countries, even getting international uh, loans, commercial loans at discounted pricing, mm-hmm. is very difficult to assimilate into their own uh, financial That's systems and commission new uh, or old plants. Yeah, now look, in Africa there are no plants. So uh, luckily we are building for the first time. Yes, first. Now, they didn't have telephones. Mm-hmm. They didn't it's have trunk Google. loans. That was true of India too. Yes. So basically you have more connectivity, more communication happening from the new technology. So fortunately, most of Africa is not, not powered with coal plants because they're not powered at all. Correct. So the new, the new that comes in must be renewed. And, they, you know, it can be done. And I, I really think that if they do the sums, if they, if they come up with these pledges and these kind of views and ideas and policies and run elections based on that. And you mentioned that. Yes. That there should be a political manifesto. It, it that. should be. Now, I had asked you, uh, 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 I think, two years ago at the Oxford uh, School Conference at, uh, at the Oxford Union. I think that's where we met uh, most recently. I had mentioned to you that is it time to, for uh, an international statesman like you, to mobilize political leaders around the world and create a climate manifesto. It is, you know, it's the Planet B manifesto. Correct. Now, we fought the 2018 elections and in the Maldives exactly on a renewable energy manifesto strategy. strategy and less extraction and everything more environmentally sustainable. So that was the manifesto of your That was the manifesto. Now, is it time for uh, President Nasheed to create political capacity in other countries? Well, it is. I think uh, it, it would be very good. Now, when when people lose elections, uh, they, they blame somebody. They, yeah, they blame. And, and it's good, you know, after losing an election, uh, the losers would be thinking of a manifesto of ideas for the next election. Correct. And that is the time to go in there and tell them, and tell them, look, you know, you've been trying to sell this old thing, and you've been losing. There's no buyers anymore. No buyers anymore. They've been losing and losing and losing. The minute you come up with something new, then people buy it. You can, you could, you could promise jobs. You could promise power plants. You could promise roads. You could promise schools, health centers, transport, everything, but in renewables. And I think the, 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 this is so the low part. carbon or no carbon alternatives it must be mainstream. Must, must be they main. must not be an alternative. There's, they are. So this is this is. We the must project. use fossil fuels only as an alternative where there is no other option. The renewables, low carbon solutions well, must be the main principle. This, this fossil fuel thing is Victorian technology. It's cumbersome. It's old. It's obsolete. You don't touch it. 
it's it's unviable. Great. I think uh, we have covered a vast territory. I'm <laughs> going to ask you one short question. Kigali Global Dialogue. Yeah. Uh, are these dialogues and convening important? And is it time for Maldives to bring leaders from all over the world, thinkers from all over the world, and show them the Maldives experience? Experience of preserving democracy, experience of going green, and experience of being a happy people. And also uh, the new challenges that we face. That we do face a lot of new challenges, not just climate change. Returning ISIS oh, is, a, is a huge challenge that we are facing. Yes, please come to the Maldives, and I think it would be good for us to have this conversation in the Maldives. First, it's excellent that you're having it here. It's excellent that you're having it here. This country needs it, and it deserves it. It's a, it's a big, big contribution from ORF to, uh, to Rwanda, to the people of Rwanda, and to the people of Africa on the whole. We know, you know what happened in this country. And, and to come up with these kind of dialogues and conversations, it's very, very good. And, and I think you know, you, you're doing an excellent job. Not that I'm trying to scratch your back, but you know, you're doing an excellent job. And our next stop would be Maldives, Mr. President, President. So you, I see I have scratched your back enough so that you can right. come to the Maldives. Uh, but uh, for our viewers, uh, Maldives and India share a unique relationship. And President Nasheed and the Observer Research Foundation share a very long history. Very, very long history. We will certainly make all attempts to have this next conversation with the President in Malay next year. Thank you for joining us for this live studio. Thank you.